experts in the field. If you're watching and have questions, please post them as a comment on whichever platform you're watching, and we'll answer live if time permits. Um, today's episode is all about distribution at scale. And Alex Zambelli, who's technical product manager for video platforms at Warner Brothers Discovery, is our guest. I've known Alex uh, at least 15 years, going back to his history with Microsoft. And we'll start there, where he was a codec evangelist and a, uh, and a producer of events like Olympics and, and uh, NFL football. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear about some of his experiences there. And then we'll walk through the various um, points in his career where he got to Warner Brothers. And there's a lot of stops that are worth worth chatting about. And then, you know, I'm I'm known, I think, as a as a codec uh, theorist, right? You know, I do a lot of testing and I render conclusions. And and that that's useful in a lot of ways, or at least I hope it is, but but it it's not real world. And Alex just has a ton of real world experience that we're that he's going to share with us today. Things, you know, things as is, is, is high level as is, is where the industry needs to go to to make it simpler for publishers like Warner Brothers to, to focus on content as opposed to, you know, compatibility and, and issues as deep diving as, you know, what what's his uh, what's his percentage of VBR, uh, you know, is it 200% constrained VBR, 300% constrained VR and in and, and, and particular to what I'm interested in, when does a company like Warner Brothers look at adopting a new codec. And I think Alex is going to talk about the decision that they're in the process of making, which is, you know, whether to to integrate uh, AV1. So it, Alex just has a ton of real world experience in live event production at huge scales, as well as, you know, premium content uh, encoding and delivery, um, you know, with with some of the biggest names in, in the industry. So I'm way excited to have Alex joining us today. Alex, thanks for being here. Jan, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Real pleasure, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next uh, hour talking to you. Yeah, this is um, we don't get a chance to do this uh, that often. So, so, so let's let's dive in. Was your you know I, I, I'm not uh, intimately familiar with your or familiar with your CV. Did you start in streaming at Microsoft, or was there a stop before that? Uh, I did start my career at Microsoft, so that was uh, my very first job uh, out of college, actually. Uh, so this was back in uh, 2002. Uh, and I started out uh, as a uh, software tester. So I started as a software test engineer in the Windows Media Player. Um, and I worked uh, on both Windows Media Player and uh, and then uh, the codec team at Microsoft as a software tester for about five years. Uh, and so it was during that like second sort of phase of my software testing uh, role there, uh, working on the codecs where I started uh, working with the VC1 uh, codec, uh, which at the time was, a new codec for Microsoft in the sense that it was the first uh, codec that Microsoft had standardized. Um, so there was a, a codec called Windows Media Video 9, WMB9, uh, and Microsoft took that through SMPTE uh, uh, to basically get it standardized. And so that became VC1. Uh, and uh, some folks may recall that that was basically mm -hmm. one of the uh, required codecs for both HD DVD and Blu-ray at the time. And so that's kind of what put it on the map. Um, and so during that time where I was, you know, testing uh, the VC1 encoder, I uh, started interacting a lot with uh, Microsoft's external uh, customers and partners. And so that then transitioned me into uh, my next job at Microsoft, which was uh, technical evangelism. Um, so I ended up doing uh, technical evangelism for uh, VC1 uh, for a few years, and then uh, my scope broadened to include really all Microsoft media technologies that were at the time available and could be used for building uh, uh, large uh, online streaming solutions. Uh, and so when I started Microsoft, you know, working in digital media, I mean, these, you know, in 2002, it was still, you know, mostly dominated by physical media. So we're still talking about CDs, DVDs, uh, you know, Blu-rays. Um, by the time, you know, I uh, transitioned into this uh, technical evangelism job, which is around 2007 or so, streaming was really starting to pick up steam. And so from that point on, really, you know, till to this day, my career has been focused uh, on streaming, really, because uh, that has become the dominant method of distribution for digital media. Um, and so uh, I mentioned that uh, starting around 2007 or so, uh, I started doing technical evangelism for a whole bunch of different uh, Microsoft media technologies. So 
at the time, uh, Silverlight was a uh, technology Microsoft was developing that was a uh, competitor to Flash. Uh, and so it was seen as a solution for building rich web pages because uh, everything was still you know, primarily online on, you know, uh, through websites and browsers at the time. Uh, mobile applications haven't even like started picking up uh, yet. And, uh, and so really like the primary way of delivering stream media at the time was through the browser. And this is where uh, Serverlight came in. It was a plugin that allowed uh, both like rich web experiences to be built, but also really uh, uh, great uh, premium uh, media experiences as well. And so that included even things like digital rights management. So uh, using PlayReady DRM to protect the content and so on. So how did that transition to actual production and your work at the Olympics and, and with uh, the NFL? Yeah, uh, so uh, at the time, Microsoft uh, was partnering with uh, NBC Sports on uh, several projects. Uh, the first one that I was involved with was the uh, 2008 uh, Olympics in Beijing. And so NBC Sports had the, uh, the broadcast rights, the Olympics still does. Um, and uh, they wanted to basically put all of the Olympics content online uh, for essentially any NBC uh, sports subscriber to be able to access. Um, and that was, I think, a first where that was like really the first attempt to put all of Olympics uh, streaming online. So up until that point, if you wanted to watch an event, you had to wait for it to be you know, broadcast on uh, either your local uh, NBC station or you know, one of the uh, cable channels. Uh, and so if it wasn't, you know, broadcast and live linear it you can never see it wasn't available and so nbc sports uh had the idea to you know put all of that content uh, online so the very first version of the uh nbc olympics uh site that we built in 2008 was still using windows media for live streaming but was starting to use uh server light and uh what at the time was actually the very first sort of prototype implementation of adaptive streaming at microsoft uh, to do uh, on demand. Um, and then the next project we did with NBC Sports in 2009 was supporting Sunday Night Football. And for that, we built a fully uh, uh, adaptive streaming based uh, website. So that was the origins of Microsoft's uh, smooth streaming technology. Uh, so Microsoft had taken that prototype that was built during the 2008 Olympics and uh, uh, essentially productized that into smooth streaming. So we had both live streams uh, uh, in HD, uh, which was again kind of breakthrough at the time, like to be able to do HD at scale. Um, now, it just you know, we take it for granted, but in 2009, that was really seen as a as a big deal. Uh, and then 2010, uh, Vancouver Olympics. Uh, that's that's when really we kind of went, you know, full, you know, uh, uh, full on smooth streaming, uh, everything was uh, basically available on demand and live in smooth streaming. And so, uh, so yeah, those are, those are some really, uh, I would say groundbreaking events that we did. Um, uh, we ended up being nominated for a few uh, sports Emmys, technical Emmys at the time. Um, I don't remember uh, which years we won or didn't win, but, uh, but yeah, like it was, uh, I think recognized by the industry is also like pushing the MLO. I'm remembering, and, and I could, I don't want to mix you up with another technology, but I'm remembering either Monday or Sunday night football with a, a player that had four different views that you could kind of page through. Was that you that, guys? That was us. Yeah, that was us. Yep. That was uh, Sunday night football. Uh, so yeah, we had basically, you could watch uh, multiple uh, uh, camera angles simultaneously. And one of the cool things about that is that, uh, we used uh, smooth streaming uh, to do that, where it was actually a single manifest that had all four camera angles in the same manifest. And so switching between the camera angles was completely seamless because um, it was similar to switching bit rates uh, the way you do in Dash or HLS today. Um, so it was a very cool solution that uh, actually, I, I don't think we've even rebuilt it since then. It was, <laughs> it was a feature <laughs> that we developed in 2009 and then sort of lost to, to history. Um... So what are, you know, did you actually go to the Olympics or were you working back in the, in the plumbing and in, 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 in uh, Redmond or? Uh, yeah, we were, we were on the back end side of it. So, uh, I, I did get a chance to go to one, uh, Olympic event at the Vancouver Olympics. It's since they were, you know, close to Seattle where I live. Uh, but other than that, like, yeah, we were all, uh, you know, uh, we spent most of those projects, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, windowless rooms and, you know, data centers. 
mostly mostly in Redmond, uh, sometime in Las Vegas, because uh, we were working uh, closely with uh, Ice Cream Planet at the time as well, uh, who were based out of Las Vegas. Uh, spent a lot of time in New York as well at uh, 30 Rock, because uh, NBC Sports was still at the 30 Rock location at the time. So, so yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it was a fun time. What were the big takeaways? You know, if you were, you met somebody on a plane and they asked, Gosh, I'm doing a live streaming event that's huge. What what did you learn from the Olympics? What what are the high level things that you took away from that that, that you've implemented, you know, throughout your career? Uh, I, I think uh, you know one of the uh, I would perhaps obvious take of it takeaways was that you know live streaming is is hard in that it's 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 not on demand. Like everything you know about on demand streaming. You kind of have to throw that out the window when you start working on live streaming because uh, you're dealing with very different issues. You're dealing with real time issues, uh, and so even something as simple as you know packets getting lost, like on the way from your origin, uh, you know, encoder to your distribution encoder, and dealing with you know packet loss, and then dealing with you know segment loss on the publishing side, um, and figuring out like you know how do you how do you handle that. Um, and you know, uh, handling blackouts and ad insertions, and so uh, everything's under a lot more pressure, right? Because you know, if if you're doing on-demand streaming, and if there's something wrong with the content, if there's something wrong with you know the origin or any part of your delivery chain, you sort of have a little bit of leeway in that, like you know, you got you got time to address it, uh, you know, and hopefully you'll, you'll address it very quickly, but. You know, if if the content goes down for you know a few hours, like it's it's fine. Like you know, people will come back later. Whereas with live, you don't have that luxury. You really have to be on top of it. And so, uh, my memory of it is that you know every time we were doing these events, uh, it was all hands on deck. I mean, we had everyone from you know Microsoft to NBC to Akamai to you know Ice Cream Planet, like all the all the different companies that are involved in these projects. Like we would just have everyone on calls ready, you know, to, to go fix whatever need to be fixed uh, in real time, because that was the nature of it. So, so that, that was a big, you know, learning uh, uh, lesson there was that live is not on demand. Like you have to, you have to really uh, give it a lot more focus, give it a lot more attention than uh, you would necessarily to, to on demand. Does live ever get easy? I mean, it, it's even, even events like, like what we're doing today, it seems like there's always something that breaks or there's always the potential for it. You never feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's, I think that's a great way to describe it. Like it, it's just, you know, it, you're never comfortable because yeah, something <laughs> could, could go wrong. And then you, you can't just say, well, you know, we'll fix it, you know, uh, you know, sometime in the next 24 hours, you have to fix it right now. Right. And so it's like, yeah, if our Zoom link went down right now, like we'd be in trouble, right? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, no backup for that. So you jump from the uh, frying pan into the fire. I think your next stop was Ice Cream Planet, where you're doing you're doing live events all the time. So tell us about that. Yeah, so in in uh, at the very end of 2012, I left Microsoft and I joined Ice Cream Planet. Uh, and Ice Cream Planet, uh, for those not familiar with the company, so that was a, a startup uh, uh, out of Las Vegas, uh, started by uh, Mio Babic, um, and uh, they, you know, uh, built a reputation for themselves as, you know, being a, a premium live event uh, streaming provider. Uh, and at the time, uh, they wanted to get into uh, live linear, and they wanted to also start building their own technology, and so. Uh, 2012 was when um, Mio started a software engineering team in Redmond, and so uh, the next year I joined that software engineering team. And what I worked on was the very first uh, live encoder that was built in-house at Ice Cream Planet. Um, and so one of the uh, ideas at the time was to build it all on commodity hardware. So again, something that we now kind of take for granted because now we're accustomed to things running in the cloud, and so we assume that, like, yeah, of course you can go spin up a live encoder in the cloud and it's running on just you know commodity hardware that's there but 2012 2013 that was not the case right it was mostly hardware based encoders that you had to you know uh, actually put in a data center and maintain and so the idea that neo had was like let's run it on commodity hardware let's build the let's build a cloud-based live encoder uh, and so uh, i worked in that product for uh, about four uh four and a half years uh and 2015, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was 2015 or 2016, uh, Ice Cream Planet got acquired by Turner, uh, and Turner uh, was part of Warner Media, and so uh, Ice Cream Planet uh, 
became a subsidiary of Warner Media. Um, okay. And so that was a pretty nice, you know, ending to to that story as well. So, real briefly, if you can, I'm, I'm trying to. So we had Silverlight here, and then we had mm -hmm. Flash here, and somehow we ended up with both of those going away. And and I guess it was the whole HTML5 thing. And that brought HLS and uh, Smooth is in there. But you, when did you transition from VP or VC1 to 264? And you know, how did that work? Yeah. Uh, so when, when Serverlet launched originally, the only video code that could support it uh, was VC1. And then I think it was a uh, third or fourth version of Serverlet uh, where right, HD64 yeah. support was added. And I think Flash added it around the same time. I think it was literally like uh, one month after another. Um, so the, the challenge with basically building any streaming solution in HTML uh, around that time, so kind of, again, going back to 2007, 2008 uh, uh, timeframe, um, the challenge was that HTML was just not ready. Um, There's basically no APIs in HTML that would allow you to do streaming with the level of control that, that was needed. Um, and so, um, there, you know, there were some workarounds uh, where, like, for example, uh, Apple went and, you know, when they when they came out came out with HLS as their streaming protocol, they baked it into the Safari browser. And so, you know, if you use the the video tag in uh, HTML in Safari, you could basically just point it at a M3U8 uh, playlist, and it would just work. Um, but that was, you know, exception rather than the rule. I mean, most other uh, browser implementations, whether it was, you know, Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer at the time, uh, did not do that. And so there was this kind of challenge of, well, how do you stream? Uh, and so we're, what basically Flash and, and Serverlight, I think, brought to the table at that, that time was an opportunity to really kind of uh, leapfrog HTML uh, to basically like just to advance it, even if it, you know, was a proprietary plugin, but advance the technology to a point where it was usable. And, and so uh, one of the innovations that uh, Serverlight brought was the concept of a media stream source, uh, which today now exists in uh, HTML. So when, when you go build a solution in HTML today, that's a streaming solution, you're using the media source extensions and the encrypted media extensions uh, uh, portions of the HTML spec. At the time, that was not yet in HTML5. Uh, so, uh, Serverlet had that approach of, well, we're not going to bake in any particular stream protocol into the uh, plugin. We're going to basically open up an API that allows you to go handle your own downloading of segments and parsing of segments. And then you essentially just pass those uh, uh, video and audio streams into a media buffer. And then the plugin goes and you know decodes and renders that and handles the rest. Um, and then another crucial part, I think, of what, you know, Serverlight brought to the table was DRM, because uh, that was something that, again, HTML just didn't have a, so, a good solution for uh, content protection. Um, and, you know, the reality of the industry that we work in is that if you want to provide premium content to audiences, uh, you have to protect it. Uh, generally, uh, content owners, uh, you know, studios will not let you go stream uh, their, their content just in the clear. And so it was a big deal that you know Serverlet could you know both enable streaming but also enable content protection of the content. Uh, and then you know Flash ended up doing the same with you know Flash DRM, Adobe uh, DRM, as well. And so it around I think you know it was 2012, 2011, if I remember, uh, where sort of both Serverlet and Flash uh, kind of uh, went away and were replaced by HTML. Um, and uh, it was because by that point, HTML had matured enough where that was feasible. Um, and there were, there were still some growing pains there. I remember there was a period where kind of, it was kind of like we were neither here nor there. But, you know, by I would say like 2014, 2015, like HTML5 had all the needed APIs to enable, you know, basic stuff like implementing, you know, Dash and HLS and smooth streaming in the browser uh, and, you know, protecting it with DRM. So, uh, so you know that's where we are today, and yeah, it took a while to get there. Okay, um, real quickly, you know, what do you do at Warner Media? So I'm hearing when were you a programmer or were you a live video producer? You started testing, which is you know. So what are your what's your skill set? Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned that earlier when I started my career, I, I started in engineering and then transitioned to technical evangelism. Uh, by the time that I uh, 
uh, moved over to Ice Cream Planet. So my job at that point became product management. Uh, and so I've been a product manager uh, since since then. So for the past 10 years. Uh, so after Ice Cream, uh, I went to Hulu and I was a product manager for the video platform at Hulu for five years. Um, and then my most recent job. So for the past uh, two years, I've been at Warner Brothers Discovery, also product managing the video platform here as well. Um, so what what my you know responsibilities are as a product manager uh, is I focus on the the video platform itself. So I focus uh, in, specifically today. I focus on most of transcoding packaging. Um, so uh, for the most recent launch of uh, Max, uh, which is the new service uh, that combines Discovery Plus and HBO Max, uh, they just launched last week. Uh, so I was the product manager for the. Uh, VOD transcoding and packaging platform there. Uh, and so that involved, you know, uh, essentially defining the requirements uh, of, you know, what are the different codecs and formats we need to support, uh, what the workflows should look like, you know, how do we get content in from the media supply chain, uh, what are all the different permutations of formats we need to produce, uh, you know, what kind of signaling needs to be in the manifest so the players would be able to distinguish between HDR and SDR. So all those types of technical technical details, like those, are part of my job. Okay, let's do a speed round of some some technical encoding issues that uh the, 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 your answers will appear in, appear in my next book. Um, <laughs> where are you on um, encoding cost versus quality? So you know, and that would translate to are you using the the placebo or the or the uh, the very slow preset? And I don't know if you use X.264, but do you use that to get the best possible? quality for bit rate, irrespective of encoding cost, or do you do something kind of in the middle? I'm sure you're not in, in the ultra fast category, but we're real quick. Where are you in that, in that uh, uh, analysis? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we currently do use uh, X264 and X265 uh, for uh, the VOD transcoding uh, at, at uh, Warner Bros. Discovery. Um, so um, we typically use either like the, the, slow or slower presets uh for those encoders um though one of the things we have been discussing recently is that you know we perhaps shouldn't necessarily use the same preset across you know all bit rates or even across all content and so that's an idea that we've been exploring where uh you know for you know if you look at your typical encoding ladder right you got you know let's say you know 1080p or you know 2160p at the top but you know at the bottom of your ladder you'll have you know 320 by 180, yeah. you might have a 640 by 360, right? And so then the question becomes, well, why use the same preset for both those resolutions, right? Because like, you know, X264 very slow uh, is going to take a lot less time on your uh, 640 by 360 resolution than on your, you know, uh, 1080p resolution. And so that's one of the ideas that we've been looking at is like, okay, we should probably apply different, uh, this, different presets for different resolutions, uh, different complexities. And then not all content is necessarily the same in the sense that it's not equally complex, right? So perhaps not everything requires uh, the very slow preset. Um, and then not all content is equally popular. Uh, if there's a particular piece of content that's uh, you know watched by 20 million viewers versus something that's watched by 10,000 viewers, the one that's watched by 20 million probably should get the more complex preset, the slower preset because whatever extra compute you spend on that is going to be worth it because it will hopefully translate to some CDN savings on the other side. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so hopefully that answers uh, your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, when did you, you talked about X.265, that's ATBC. When did you add that and why? Or were you even there? Did, did Warner add it before you got there? Uh, yeah, so uh, HBO Max had already been using HVC, uh, and so this was uh, so we, you know, uh, obviously continued using it uh, for for Max as well. Uh, on the Discovery Plus side, we had been using HVC for some 4K content, but th there wasn't a lot of it, and so it was really mostly all H.264 on the Discovery Plus side. But uh, with Max, uh, we are using uh, obviously H.264 still, and we are using HVC uh as well uh for both sdr and hdr content uh okay. and so uh right now for example if you go you know play something uh on max on you know most devices it's actually going to play back in hevc uh so even if it's sdr it will be uh 10-bit hevc 
Um, and then obviously if it's HDR, it will definitely be HVC. Okay. How many encoding ladders do you have for a typical piece of content? Uh, so the way we uh, define, when you say how many encoding ladders, you mean sort of like different variations of encoding ladders, or do you mean like steps within the, the ladder? Uh, different variations of encoding ladders. Uh, so we have right now, uh, I'm literally looking at the spreadsheet right now, and I think <laughs> it's about uh, six or eight different uh, uh, variations right now. Um, and so what we've tried to do is build an encoding ladder where, uh, depending on the source resolution, we don't have to necessarily have different permutations of the ladders. And so, uh, you know, we have sort of a UHD ladder where depending on where the, what the source resolution is, uh, that determines kind of where you stop in that ladder, uh, but doesn't change the ladder necessarily itself. Um, where the permutations come in is uh, things like frame rates. So if the source is 25p or 30p or 24p, uh, that's going to go and use a different ladder than if the source is uh, 50p or 60p. Um, uh, cause that is one of the things we we've done for max that wasn't supported before, for example, is high frame rates. So previously everything was, uh, capped at 30 FPS. Um, and most of that was due to the fact that, uh, there wasn't really a lot of source content, uh, on HBO max, for example, that, uh, required more than 30 FPS. Um, uh, but now that the content libraries of discovery plus and HBO max are combined, right? There's a lot more reality TV on the discovery plus side. A lot of that is shot at you know uh, 50 FPS if it's uh, abroad or 60 FPS if it's US, uh, and so we wanted to preserve that temporal resolution as much as possible, and so we've started to support uh, high frame rates as well. And so we have different encoding ladders for different frame rates, um, and then of course there's different encoding ladders for SDR versus HDR, and even within HDR we have different encoding ladders for HDR10 versus uh, Dolby Vision 5, for example. Okay, what about for different devices? So if I'm, you know, if I'm watching on my smart TV and then I transition to my smartphone, am I seeing the same ladder or do you have different ladders for, for different uh, devices? Yeah, at, at this moment, they're the same ladders for, for all the devices. Uh, we might deliver uh, different subsets of the ladder uh, for certain devices. And so, uh, but that's typically, you know, capping on the, on the high end of the ladder. So, if, for example, some device cannot handle 60 FPS or if it cannot handle resolutions above 1080p, for example, then we might uh, uh, intentionally cap the, the manifest itself that we're delivering to, the, uh, to that device. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, you know, different bit rates uh, and different encodings, we, we're not differentiating it yet between different devices. Um, it's a uh, like so. I'll give you my personal take on on that question, which is that in most cases it's not really necessary, in my opinion, to to have different encoding ladders for different devices because it you know your 1080p should look great no matter whether you're watching it on a iPhone or uh, you know Apple TV, um, and so having you know two different 1080p encodes like doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, I've, I've definitely heard people say, well, you know, perhaps on the lower end of the, the bit rate ladder, right, where, you know, we have your lower bit rates, lower resolutions, that's where you need to have differentiation. But again, in my opinion, there's no harm in delivering, uh, you know, 100, 200 kilobit per second uh, bit rates in a manifest to a uh, smart TV, because most likely it's never going to play it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you can put in the manifest, you can deliver it to the, to the TV or to, you know, streaming stick in, mo in you know, in, in vast majority of cases, it's never even going to touch that bit rate. It's just going to skip right over it, go straight for the, you know, HD and the UHD. Um, yeah. And the only times you might ever see that low bit rate is, you know, if something catastrophic happens to your network and it really, the player struggles so badly and needs to drop down to that level. Okay. What's your, um, What's your VBR maximum rate on a percentage basis? So, you know, we when we started out, it was CBR. So your max was 100% of your target. Where are you now with your VBR um, for, for your, your premium content? Yeah. Um, so we, we've taken uh, an approach uh, with X264 and X365 of uh, relying primarily on the CRF rate control. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's a CRF rate control that uses a bit rate and a buffer uh, cap, right? So when you 
or defining your, you know, when you're writing your command line if, in FFmpeg, right, you can set the CRF target, but you can also specify a VBV uh, buffer size and a right. VBV max rate. And so we are doing that. And the reason behind that is um, we want to make sure that we're controlling essentially the codec level uh, at each resolution, each bit rate, and that we're um, sort of keeping the the peaks also uh, uh, constrained that way. And so, you know, I can give you an example where you know if it's something like uh, let's say uh, you know HVC uh, and it's you know 1080p. Uh, you know, you might want to stay, you know, at codec level four rather than codec level four one because you know four one might or that one actually like maybe is not as big of a deal. But for example, like what if you're choosing between level five and level five one, right? There's certain devices that might not support five one, for example. And so in order to stay under codec level uh five uh for HEVC you have to maintain you have to stay under a certain buffer size right and so that's how that's what ends up uh driving a lot of the actual caps that we set okay and and kind of circling back i mean crf mm -hmm. gives you a measure of per title encoding as well so you are, is that intentional yeah that, that's that's a uh, part of it yeah is that with crf right um really when you specify your your vpv max rate you're just specifying your highest average bit rate really for the video uh, and so as long as you're comfortable with that max rate, then, you know, you can also count on CRF probably bringing your average bit rate below that max rate most of the time. Uh, and so if we said, for example, you know, uh, 10,000 kilobits uh, per second as the max rate, most of the time, you know, the CRF target is really going to bring in that average bit rate much lower around, you know, five or six megabits. Uh, and so that is a way of kind of getting per title encoding in a way. And achieving CD and savings without sacrificing quality, right? Because depending on the complexity of your content, mm -hmm. it's either going to be way below your max rate or it's going to hit against the max rate. And then at least you're sort of uh, um, putting out, you know, you're capping the the um, highest possible bit rate that you, you'll have for that video. Cool. I mean, that's that's a pretty creative way to do it. Um, what's what's the impact of DRM on encoding ladder, if anything? So I know there's a difference between hardware and software DRM, and there are some limitations on content that you can distribute with software-based DRM. So can you can you encapsulate? We're, we're we're a bit run short short of time, but can you can you encapsulate that in like you know a minute or two? Yeah. Uh, so the way most of the uh, content licensing agreements are structured, uh, you know, typically under the content security uh, uh, chapter, there's um, there's requirements uh, around what kind of um, essentially security levels are required uh, to play back certain resolutions um, and and then often uh, uh, what kind of output uh, protection is required. And so uh, typically what you'll see is that something like uh, Widewine L1, which is a hardware based uh, uh, security level of Widewine or hardware based protection. And then on the Play Ready side, something like SL3000, which is also the hardware-based uh, uh, implementation of Play Ready, those will be required for uh, uh, 1080p and above, for example. Uh, so a lot of the content licensing agreements will say, unless you have you know, hardware-backed DRM on the, on the uh, playback client, you cannot play anything you know, uh, from 1080p and above. Um, and then you know, uh, there'll be typically, uh, and they'll have like similar requirements around each level. So they'll they'll group your resolutions typically in SD, HD, full HD, UHD, and each one of those will have different DRM requirements uh, in terms of security levels. Um, also requirements around HTCP, whether that needs to be enforced or not, whether it's HTCP one, HTCP two. And so what that essentially means in practice then is that when you're doing your ABR ladder, uh, you have to define those security groups based on resolution, and you have to assign different content keys uh, to those groups. And so your uh, video uh, uh, streams up to let's say 720p might get encoded with one encryption key, and then you know between 720p and 1080p gets a different encryption key, and then everything above 1080p gets another encryption key, and audio gets a different encryption key. And so, wow. by do by doing that, we uh, essentially accomplish that at playback time when uh, the licenses are being requested by the players for each of those bit rates. 
because they're using different keys, you can now associate different playback policies with each key. And so you can say, well, this SD uh, content key, for example, has a policy that doesn't require HTCP to be enforced and doesn't require hardware uh, uh, level of protection. Whereas, you know, the HD group or the UHD group might require those. Uh, and so that's, uh, so that's really, you know, something that we do today in response to the way the content licensing agreements are structured. Uh, and so, you know, in the future that might change. Uh, I, 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 like my impression is that we're actually moving in a, in a, uh, direction of more DRM rather than less, less DRM. Uh, so like, even as recently as, you know, three, four years ago, like some, some, uh, studios, some content owners were still allowing certain resolutions to be delivered in the clear, uh, like SD, for example. Um, and a lot of that's kind of going away where now essentially it's like, look, if you're going to do DRM, you might as well do DRM across the board because it actually kind of makes it less complicated that way. Um, and so, uh, and one of the things I've also noticed is that like when it comes to HDR, for example, it's, uh, the strictest requirements, you know, for all of HDR. And so, you know, even with HDR, you have an encoding ladder that range, ranges, you know, from UHD all the way down to, you know, uh, you know, 360p or something. Um, and the requirements and the uh, agreements are, well, you must use hardware-based DRM and you must use HDCP2, uh, you know, 2.3 for the whole HDR ladder. And so it seems that that's the trend of the industry is that we're, we're actually moving just towards using DRM for everything. So what, what what's the difference between hardware and software? Hardware is, is that a, a browser versus mobile device? thing or you know where is software drm and where is hardware yeah it's uh, so uh the difference is in the implementation of the drm client itself and so uh if you basically want to uh get the the uh, highest security uh certificate from either uh you know google or uh microsoft for their drm systems uh you essentially have to bake in their drm client uh into the secure video path of the system so that typically means a tight coupling with the hardware uh, decoder as well. So that essentially when you send, uh, you know, a video stream to the uh, decoder, once it, once it goes past the decoder, there's no getting those bits back, right? So essentially once you send it to the decoder, at that point it, it's secure decoding and secure decryption. Uh, well, first I guess secure decryption and secure decoding and then it goes straight to the render, right? And so there's no API call that you can make as an application that says, now that you've you know, decrypted and decoded these bits, like I you know, hand them back to me. And so that's, a, that's typically called a secure video path or secure media path. And so that's what you get with a hardware-based DRM. Um, Software-based DRM you know, does either some or all of those uh, uh, aspects of decoding and decryption in software. And therefore, there's a risk that you know some somebody could essentially uh, hack that that path at some point and get those decoded bits back and be able to you know steal the content. Okay, so if I'm watching uh, two six five on a browser without hardware support, I'm likely to be limited in the resolution I can view if it's premium content because the the publisher says if it I don't want anything larger than you know three sixty p going to software. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, today, for example, uh, if you're using Chrome, for example, uh, so wide mind DRM is uh, available in Chrome, uh, but only L3, which is the software, uh, based, uh, uh, implementation of, of wide mind. And so, uh, oftentimes if you're using Chrome, you actually get worse video quality with some of the premium streaming services services than if you're using edge or Safari, for example, because both Safari on Mac and edge on windows do support hardware DRM because they, they are just more tightly integrated with the operating system. And so they're able to essentially achieve that secure video path between the browser and the operating system and the output. Okay. So let's, um, let's jump to the packaging because you, uh, you and the HLS dash or CMAF camp these days. Uh, well, both. Uh, so at uh, both uh, Wonder Bros Discovery and then my previous job at Hulu, uh, we, we've been using both HLS and Dash. And interestingly enough, actually, like even distributing in it, uh, this, like the, the split between those two is almost identical. So uh, we use HLS for uh, Apple devices and we use Dash uh, for streaming to all other devices. 
Um, what's common to them is uh, the CMAF uh, format. And so um, one of the things that I kind of get a little bit annoyed about uh, in our industry is when people refer to uh, CMAF as a streaming protocol and I always kind of <laughs> feel like I need to correct him and say, no, no, it's not a streaming <laughs> protocol. Uh, because, uh, you know, CMAF is really two things, right? Like CMAF is on one hand, a standardized version of what we, you know, frequently call fragmented MP4, right? The ISO based media file format. Um, and what the CMAF spec did is basically just define, look, if you're going to use FMP4 and HLS and dash, here's, you know, the boxes you need to have, and here's how common encryption gets applied to that and so on. And so it's really just a more kind of button down version of you know what we have always called fmp4 um and so in many cases like you know if you have been packaging uh you know either dash or hls you know in fmp4 media segments you're most likely already cmaf compliant you're already using cmaf um but the other thing that cmaf is right like the cmaf spec also defines a hypothetical a logical uh, media presentation model and so it essentially describes what really kind of when you read through the lines will sound a lot like HLS or Dash without HLS or Dash. It's really defining kind of here's the relationship between tracks and segments and fragments and chunks. And here's how you sort of address like all those different levels of the media presentation. Um, and so you can then think of, you know, HLS and Dash really being kind of the the physical manifestations right of of that hypothetical presentation model um and there's a really great spec that uh cta authored so i think it's cta uh think 5005 um uh, that is the hls dash interoperability spec uh and it's heavily based on cmaf and using kind of cmaf as the really the unifying model and then really describing how both uh, HLS and Dash plug into CMAF and how they really kind of describe the, you can describe the same concepts in both. And so it's almost like HLS and Dash are just programming languages that are describing the same, you know, uh, sort of pseudocode. Okay. And the CT, you know, I want to come back to some other topics, but, but one of the topics important to you is, is the CTA part of the organization that's going to make it simpler for publishers to publish content and just focus on the content development and not the compatibility um because it seems like that's a pretty compelling issue for you yeah i mean i i, I hope that you know cta will uh, make some uh, efforts in that space uh i i think you know a lot of what they've been doing is uh trying to improve the interoperability uh in the streaming industry and so i think uh like it, it does feel like cta wave is the kind of the right uh, arena for that um what one of the issues that you know i think today makes uh deploying streaming solutions uh really complex and challenging is that uh we have a lot of different uh application development platforms um uh, you know just before this call i kind of went and counted you know the, the number of uh app platforms that we have at uh at wbd uh that, you know we just developed for max and it's basically about uh you know a dozen or 16 uh different application development platforms. Now there's overlap between some of them. So, you know, Android uh, TV and Fire TV are kind of, you know, more or less the same thing with, you know, slight differences. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're looking at probably like the, at the very least, you know, half a dozen different app development platforms. And then, you know, worst case scenario, you're looking upwards of, you know, 20 or so app development platforms, especially once you start considering, you know, set top boxes, uh, you know, made in Europe or Asia that might be like, HBBT, HBB TV com, uh, compatible and so on. And so that's a lot of complexity because the same app needs to be built over and over and over again, right? Uh, in different programming languages, uh, using different platform APIs. Uh, and I think, I think as an industry, we're kind of unique in that sense. I, I'm not actually aware <laughs> of any industry other than streaming that needs to develop that many applications for the same thing. You know, uh, if you're uh, working in any other, I think, industry, you know, if you're working in fintech or, you know, or, or you know, anything else, right, uh, you typically have to develop three applications, a web app, iOS app, and Android app, and you're done, right? <laughs> uh, and so it's kind of crazy that, you know, in, in our industry, we have to go build, you know, over a dozen different uh, applications. But the, the practical challenges that then brings when it comes to uh, things like encoding and packaging and so on is that, uh, it's it's hard to know what the devices support um, because there is no spec, there is no standard that essentially allows 
um, that specifies APIs, for example, that every different device platform could call and expect, you know, uh, standardized answers, right? So when we talk about, uh, you know, media capabilities of a device, like, like, what are we talking? We're talking about, we need to know what decoders are supported, right? For video, for audio, but also for, for images, for, for text, right? Time text. Um, we need to know what different segment formats are supported. You know, is it CMAF, is it TS? Like what brand of CMAF, right? CMAF has this nice concept of brands, but nobody's really using it, right? Like you need to, like in order for that concept to be useful, you need to be able to query a device and say, well, what CMAF brands do you support? Um, Manifest but, formats, right? There's different versions of HLS. There's different profiles of Dash. Uh, there's different DRM systems, right? And so all, these are all things that we kind of need to know if we want to place something back on the device and, and play it well. So how do we standardize the, the playback sign? I, I think the I think probably one of the key uh, uh, steps I think we need to take is I think we need to standardize device media capabilities detection APIs. Um, and there has been some efforts uh, in W3C uh, of defining those types of APIs uh, in HTML, for example. Uh, but you know, again, not every platform uses HTML, right? And so, you know, when it comes to Roku, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, me, uh, Media Foundation, and you know, other uh, different uh, media app development platforms, um, we need essentially the same API really to be present on every platform. Um, and then, you know, once we have APIs that are standardized in the way they detect uh, media support, we need to also have a standardized uh, method of signaling uh, those capabilities to the servers. Um, because if you want to, for example, target specific devices based on their capabilities, the next question becomes, well, how do you express that? How do you signal that to the back, back end? How do you take action on that? How do you do things like manifest filtering based on that? Uh, so there's a I think there's a lot of uh, space there for standardization. There's a lot of room for standardization. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, CTA Wave or one of the other industry organizations will take some steps in that direction. Okay. Let's, um, final topic is going to be uh, AV1 or new codec adoption. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you, you're, you're in charge of, of choosing which technologies you're going to support, when does, when does a, Technology like AV1 come on your radar screen from us. I mean, you've heard of it since it was uh, announced, obviously. But when does it come on your radar screen in terms of actually supporting it in a in a Warner Brothers product? Yeah, so uh, I think the the first thing uh, I typically will look at is device adoption because that's really the I think the the most crucial requirement is that there's there has to be enough devices out there that we can actually deliver you know media to with a new codec um, that makes it worthwhile. Um, cause there's going to be cost involved in deploying a new codec, right? Like first, first co cost comes from, uh, just R and D associated with, uh, investigating a new codec, testing it, uh, uh, measuring quality, uh, then optimizing your, you know, encoding settings and so on. Right. And so that's both time and, and then also, uh, either manual or automation effort that needs to be done, right. To be able to just understand what is this codec? Is it good? <laughs> Do I want to use it? Right. Um, and then if you, you know, suddenly decide you want to deploy that codec, right, there's going to be compute costs associated with that. There's going to be storage costs associated with that. Um, and so, and then in some cases there might be licensing costs as well. Like, you know, if you're using a proprietary encoder, maybe you're, you know, paying them, or if you're using an open source encoder, well, you still might owe some royalties, uh, uh, on, you know, just, uh, usage. Um, and you're pretty familiar with that. I, I read one of your recent blog posts, and so I know that you've spent a lot of time, you know, looking at royalties and kind of different uh, uh, business models that different codecs now have. Um, so, in order to justify those costs, right, in order to make those costs actually worthwhile, there needs to be enough devices out there that can be reached by by that new codec. And so, the first really question is what what percentage of devices that are you know active devices on a service are capable of using that codec and and you know interestingly like this kind of goes back to that previous uh, uh question that you asked which is you know about device capabilities and you know how do we basically improve those things so without good healthy data coming back from players coming back from these you know uh, uh apps that tell us what's supported on the platforms 
it's hard to plan, you know, what your next clinic is to, uh, that you want to deploy. Um, like right now, for example, if I wanted to estimate the number of AV1 decoders out there, my best resource would be to go study all the different uh, hardware specs of all the different devices out there and figure <laughs> out, you know, which ones support AV1, for example, or VVC or, you know, LCVC. And then try to kind of extrapolate from that data. Okay, what what does that mean? You know, uh, how do we project that onto our particular uh, active device uh, uh, base? And so, so yeah, it's it's not it's not straightforward today. But I'm hoping that if we can improve the device capabilities detection and reporting, then we can also you know get to a point where we can just you know run a simple query and say, okay, you know, tell me what percentage of devices that you know the services seen in the last week you know supports AV1 decoding uh, and specifically maybe AV1 uh, decoding with DRM support or AV1 decoding uh, of HDR right and so it's like there's even nuances nuances within just you know uh, beyond just which codec is supported what kind of pressure do you get if any from you know your bosses or your coworkers um, about new codecs because you know we love to talk about them um, we mm -hmm. read about them all the time, but are people pounding on you and saying, you know, where's AV1 support, where's VVC, when's VVC, or do they not care? Is that not part of what they're thinking about? It's, I, I would say there's not, there's not a lot of pressure uh, from, you know, leadership to support specific codecs. I, I think, you know, they're more interested in probably, you know, uh, cost savings and looking at things like, you know, how do we lower like CDM costs? Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I usually always uh, uh, explain to them is that, it's not a perfect like one-to-one -one relationship between deploying a new codec and CDN cost savings, for example. Um, like even if you save, for example, 20% on your encoding bit rate, for example, with a new codec, that doesn't necessarily translate into 20% of CDN cost savings. Um, because in some cases, you know, like if somebody's on a three megabit uh, connection speed, for example, right? Somebody's uh, uh, on 4G and the most they can get is like you know three meg megabits per second. You being able to lower your bit rate from ten to six megabits per second is not really going to impact them, right? They're still going to be pulling the same amount of data, uh, and so that's why it's not a, a clear one-to-one -one mapping. But yeah, I would say like most of the demand for new codecs comes from from that aspect, right? From that direction, uh, rather than somebody saying, "Well, we have to support VVC because it's the latest, greatest thing out there, right? Like generally, the, like that's not the case. Uh, if anything, I'm usually the one that's you know pushing kind of for that and saying like, well, you know, we really should be moving on from HD64 and moving on to the next generation of codecs because at some point, right? Like you, you just you do have to leave old codecs behind and you know slowly deprecate them as you move on to the new technology. Okay. Do you have? I mean, do you have? A, a sophisticated financial analysis for doing this, or do you, um, or you know, do you do the numbers on a on an envelope kind of thing? It's it's more an envelope kind of thing right now. Uh, it it is, uh, yeah. It would be something that would be based on you know, again, like number of uh, you know devices supported, and then comparing that to kind of average bit rate savings, and comparing that to compute costs and uh and you know potentially licensing costs associated with it so yeah it is it is a yeah sort of a back of a paper napkin kind of calculation at this point um but i think the i think the factors are well known it's really coming up with the the data uh that you know feeds into those different variables okay a couple of questions um what about lcebc um are you doing enough live or or is that is that even a live versus VOD kind of decision? I mean, with LCVC, I, I don't think it's even a live versus VOD decision. I think with LCVC, I think what's interesting with that codec, right, is that it's a, it's an enhancement codec. It's a codec that really piggybacks on top of other codecs um, and provides, you know, better resolution, better dynamic range, for example, at bit rates that would typically be associated with lower resolutions, you know, uh, more narrow dynamic ranges. And so, um, you know, the way LCVC works is that, you know, there's a, you know, sort of a preprocessor part of it, right, uh, that essentially extrapolates the, the detail that is then lost when uh, the video is scaled down. So you can start with a 1080p video, scale it down to, let's say, 540p, encode this 540p and then you know with the lcvc decoder on the other end it can now take some of that sideband data 
and kind of attempt to reconstruct the full fidelity of the 1080p source signal. Um, and so that concept, you know, works the same whether that uh, the baseline codec they're using is H.264 uh, or 265 or VVC or AV1. Um, and so I think that's what's like interesting about that codec is that it can all, always sort of uh, let you be a step ahead of whatever the latest generation of codecs uh, is providing. Uh, and then the other nice thing about it is that there's a backwards compatibility uh, option there because if a decoder doesn't recognize that sideband data that is specific to LCBC decoding, it'll just decode your, you know, base signal, which might be half resolution or quarter resolution. And so, so I think in ABR, I see, uh, I think it, it can be very uh, applicable in ABR because typically you have a lot of different resolutions in your ladder, right? And so it's like, if you could potentially deliver that, you know, 360p resolution in your ladder at 720p, for example, uh, to a LCVC decoder, then, you know, why not? Okay. Well, we've got a technical question here. Are, are you able to deliver one CMAF package using one DRM, or do you have to have different packages for um, for Apple and the uh, and the rest of the uh, delivery platforms? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so right now, what we do is we we encrypt uh, every CMAF segment twice: once with CBCS encryption mode, and the other uh, one with CTR uh, CNC encryption mode. Um, and so the CBCS encrypted uh, segments, those are the ones that we deliver to uh, VHLS to fair play uh, devices. And then at the moment, the CTR uh, segments uh, are the ones that we then uh, package with uh, Dash and with, you know, uh, are used with uh, both PlayReady and Widevine. That said, uh, both Widevine and PlayReady have introduced support for CBCS uh, a while ago. It's actually, I think, been like probably over five years at this point. Um, and so theoretically, we could deliver those CBCS encrypted segments to all three DRM systems and it, and it would work. Uh, the challenge at the moment is that not all devices that are Widevine or PlayReady uh, clients have been updated to the latest version of right. PlayReady or Widevine because in a lot of cases there are hardware implementations. And so without basically firmware updates uh, from the device manufacturer, they're never going to be uh, up to date with the latest uh, DRM client. And so we're kind of waiting uh, to see, you know, when those last CTR only uh, Widevine and PlayReady clients uh, are going to kind of be deprecated right slowly kind of move out of the life cycle once once you know the vast majority of the player ready and widevine clients out there are cbcs compatible then that opens up the path uh, to using cbcs encrypted segments everywhere okay final question um av1 this year or not what do you think i i think probably not this year i would say um I mean, I think, you know, we might do some experimentation. I think, you know, some uh, just some research into like encoder quality and, and you know, uh, optimization this year with AV1. But I, I wouldn't expect, you know, deployment of AV1 this year, not, not because of lack of support, because I think the support is is really starting to, to you know, uh, be there in significant numbers. So uh, I know that I think that's the latest uh, Either Samsung or LG TVs, for example, uh, now include yeah, yeah. AV1 decoders as well. Um, and so, like that's always, I think, you know, often people will look at mobile as kind of being the the indicator of you know codec adoption, right? Uh, and uh, especially Apple, people will be like, okay, well, you know, if Apple adopted in, in iOS, then you know, clearly it's here. But uh, when it comes to you know like premium streaming services, uh, so I mean, when it comes to you know whether it's Max or Hulu or Amazon Prime or you know or Netflix, right? Most of that content is watched in living rooms, and so really, like the devices to watch are smart TVs and connected uh, streaming sticks. Uh, so once those devices have um, you know support for a particular codec, then in my opinion, that's really kind of the the big indicator that yeah, it might be it might be ready. What what's the um, we're, we're running over, um, but this is a question I I, I need the answer. On, but uh, what's what's the HDR picture for AV1, and how clear does that have to be? Because it seems seems like there's a bunch of TV sets out there that we know mm -hmm. play Dolby Vision and HDR10 with uh, or 10 plus with with HEDC. Do we have the same certainty that that uh, an AV1 compatible TV set will play AV1 and HDR? 
I, I don't think that certainty is there yet. Uh, and uh, I, I do need to do some more research into that particular topic because I've been curious about the same thing. So I, I think some standardization efforts have been made. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head if it's CTA no, the, or some other. The, the ATR 10 plus is now a standard for AV1. I just don't know if, if, if TBs out there will automatically support right. it. And then yeah. automatically it doesn't work for you. You've got to make sure you've got to test. Yeah, so. yeah. And and then you know with Dolby Vision, right? It's sort of like, well, until Dolby mm -hmm. says no. so, right? Like then uh, it's 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 not a standard, right? And so yeah, I mean, I think I think that's an excellent question, right? Is that like a, there's nothing from a technical perspective that should should be stopping you know somebody from using AV1 or VVC or any other you know new codec with uh, HDR, right? Because there's nothing specific to the codec that uh, HDR needs. Um, and so it's really just a matter of standardization, a matter of you know. Uh, companies implementing that standard. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this one in that like it, it, it is sort of like one of those where, yeah, it should work, but until <laughs> it's been tested and and it's been tested on many different devices, it's it's not a real thing, right? Okay, listen, we are way out of time. Alex, it, it's, uh, I don't think we've ever done this for an hour, but it's great. I, I really appreciate you, you spending time with us being so open and honest about, um, you know, how you're producing your video, because I think that helps everybody. And, you know, thanks, this has been great. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, this has been really great. Like, I feel like we could probably keep talking for another <laughs> hour or two, and I think we'd have still plenty of topics to discuss. Yeah, uh, it, I, I was I was taking some notes while we were doing this, and I um, yeah, I think I have notes for another hour at least. Okay, we'll talk to Anita about that. And I'll see, I'll see you at IBC, you gonna go to that show? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'll be at IBC, so I'll okay. most likely we'll see you there. Cool, take care, Alex, thanks, very, thanks a lot. All right, thanks so much.